Where did you say you were from? Well, good morning. So, I don't own an ugly sweater, so my daughter Jenna made me one. So there you go. Thought it wasn't bad. I am a native Floridian. I think I have two sweaters. There is no need for sweat. I grew up in Miami. I'll never forget. We had 30 degrees uh, one day uh, years ago, back in the 70s. The 70s were a time with bell bottoms and stuff a long time ago. But uh, people stayed home from school. I mean, we didn't know what to do. It was hilarious. So anyway, so today we're going to talk about. So here's the thing. When we look at that video clip, for most of us, ugly thoughts are like that. We're literally just walking through our day or even sitting, maybe having your morning toast and coffee, and all of a sudden, boom, tough actin to actin, right? Just that thought, just all of a sudden, something negative, something you remember. Some of us, while we're sleeping, have negative thoughts. Like you wake up and you were like having a nightmare about a real situation, and you're like, what in the world is going on? And so today what I want to do is we're going to look at the Christmas story. We're going to look at the shepherds and the idea of being afraid and just talk about this idea of how fear so often is what's motivating these, these thoughts that attack us. And so for the next few weeks, we're going to be looking at these different ugly attitudes and ugly things that happen. Um, and I don't know about you and fear, um, but... but Here's a question for you. When things go wrong, when something happens, what's your first thought? Is it like that kid where he says, oh no, this is bad news, and you immediately head into a dark place? You know, a lot of us do that. Just one little thing happens and we suddenly, you know, we, we catch one traffic light. Oh no, now we're going to be late for work. I mean, everything is just cascading on top of itself so often. And so I want to look at this idea and learn how to refocus on blessings and being obedient, and, and we'll get there. But I don't know how many of you scare easily. I am easily startled by people running through church. You, you literally could have just walked down the main. It's not that big of a church. It's really not like nobody saw you or probably on the camera even. It probably made it into the... It's all right. It's tough being a teenager. It's okay. She's fine. I'm making it worse. <clears throat> so I don't know how easily, I startle very easily. And anybody who knows me knows it was so bad this week that I was filling, I was putting air in one of the tires on my car. I was 20 feet from the door. My son walked out the door and he goes, hey. And I went, ah! now he goes, dad, what in the world? I'm way over here. And I said, you have to understand. I was thinking I wonder if I put too much air in this tire, if it would explode in my face. And then an, oh, oh, you know. My favorite, most embarrassing fear moment was one night I was jogging on the bridge in Titusville. I decided to go at night when it was actually a temperature that you could tolerate. And so I'm jogging on the bridge and I jogged over and down and I looked at one of the bushes. And as I looked at that bush, I remembered one of my friends telling me about somebody who had gotten grabbed and the person tried to pull them into that bush. And so I'm thinking about this and then I go to the other side and I'm running up the bridge. I don't see anybody out there at that time of night. And so I'm jogging up the bridge and my brain out of the corner of my I thought I saw a shadow and I thought, oh, that's weird. I, I think I see a shadow, but I know I'm running. So there's nobody like catching up with me unless they're trying to kill me. Nobody doing that. And as I turned, I saw the shadow right here and I looked and there was somebody right here running next to me. And here's what I did. I'll, I'll have to do this. Ah! <laughs> to which he looked right back at me and went ah! right back at me. And we both laughed, and then we both laughed, because I went, ah, and he went, ah, and I went, ha, 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 and then he kept running. I was so embarrassed, because it was so jumpy, and what happened? I was already thinking about getting mugged, and then all of a sudden a shadow, and I just lost my mind. By the way, it doesn't take that much for me, I'm just jumpy, I'm just one of those jumpy people that you startle, and I might throw something and hit you there. One of my favorite stories about my dad was, we would never, on a scary night, we would never go to my dad's side of the bed, 
You know how you would go into your parents' room and say, hey, I'm going to sleep on the floor, you know? We went to my dad's side of the bed, and I remember one time going to my dad's side of the bed, and he punched me right in the face, and I just was on the floor. He never even woke up. He just knocked me right in the face, and I was down on the floor, woke up, and from then on, it was mom's side. Hey, mom, I'm sleeping here. I don't think I've ever told that story in church. It's an absolutely true story. My kids know that one. So let's talk about some different things. So here's what we're going to talk about today. And I want to give you just some tips to help you when fear starts to come on. So here's the first thing. Any kind of change brings fear and uncertainty. You know, when we're going through life, we tend to think we have control, which is really hilarious because we don't. But we tend to think we do until change happens. That change might be the doctor saying, I need to meet with you right away. Which, don't you love that? Like, I need to meet with you right away, uh, two weeks from now, right? And so during that two weeks, you're thinking the worst. You're noticing, you know, I'm not breathing like I used to breathe. I noticed that, right? And then you go in to see them and they go, what? I just needed to see you. I, it's on my list, right? Or when your boss says, I need to talk to you. By the way, if you have an evaluation and your boss tells you 20 positive things and one negative thing, guess what you're going to remember? Right, and I think that's ever since the fall, Adam and Eve. When Adam and Eve fell, what's the first thing they thought? Oh, I, we got to hide. And so there's something in us that because of the sin nature does that. So let's pick up the Christmas story and look at Luke chapter 2, verse 8 through 11. And here's what it says. And you've heard this story a thousand times or a hundred times. And there were shepherds living out in the fields nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Time out. You're going to hear this story, so I'm just going to tell you. There are people teaching that these were Passover shepherds and that this Jesus was born in the tower and all this stuff. And here's what we know. We don't know. And it's a great theory. I hope it's true. We get to heaven. I'm going to say to God, is that true? And it could just be not true. Your faith is not based on things we're uncertain of. So don't, don't worry about that. It's a wonderful thing to talk about. Oh, Jesus was born in that watchtower, and that's how it worked. And uh, okay, but it doesn't tell us there. And so it's okay to go, maybe. By the way, it'd be okay with going, maybe. When somebody wants to get in a fight with you about some little trivial little thing, feel free going, that sounds good. I'm good with that. Did you know there was metal in your thing? No, I had no idea. Sounds good. Did you know you shouldn't do that? Probably. Have you seen how I eat? There's a lot of things I shouldn't do. All right, so there were shepherds in the field nearby, keeping watch over their flocks at night. Now listen to this. An angel of the Lord appeared to them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were terrified. Angels do not have fade in, apparently. Just boom. Right? And then it continues, and by the way, even if they did, haven't you ever had somebody walk up behind you and go, hey, I mean, if you really want to freak me out, walk into the kitchen when I'm making a peanut butter and jelly in the middle of the night and trying not to get caught. Oh, did I say that last part out loud? And say, hey, because I'll go ah, and throw the knife at you probably. All right. All right. So they, they appeared. By the way, has anybody in here ever gotten freaked out like by a suddenly? Okay, just making sure I'm not crazy. All right, I am. But. but the angel said to them, do not be afraid. To which I would respond, easy for you to say. But here's the truth about those words, do not be afraid. They're in the Bible over 300 times. There are people who say it's 365 times. And then there's people who love to argue with them about the 365 times. And here's what I say. Okay, but it's only 362. It's still a lot. It's over 300 times. Do you think God's trying to give us a hint? I mean, that's worse than telling a teenager to clean their room. 300 times, don't fear. Don't be afraid. Don't fear. Don't be afraid. You think we should get it, maybe? And then he continues, don't be afraid. Why? I bring you good news that will cause great joy for all the people. By the way, when you see an angel show up, you're not thinking good news. Right? Right? When you see an angel show up, you're thinking Balaam and the donkey. And the, and the angel says to Balaam, I was going to uh, kill you and leave your donkey. Basically, I like your donkey better than I like you. Which is scary to really think about that whole idea. But anyway, the angel said to him, do not be afraid. I bring you good news that will cause great joy to all the people. 
today in the town of David. Now, this is fulfilling an Old Testament prophecy. By the way, Luke was amazing about telling Old Testament prophecies. That's one of the reasons I think that if this had been the Passover shepherds, that he would have made a big deal about that. If this had been Passover lamb shepherds, if this had been the tower, that he would have made a big deal about that. He doesn't. He makes a big deal about where, because Isaiah predicted way back the where. And then he continues, a savior has been born to you. He is the Messiah, the Lord. When change happens in our life, when there's a suddenly in our life, listen, when God brings a suddenly, it's wonderful. But there's times in life there's suddenlies we don't like. There's times in life we get that phone call in the middle of the night. There's times in life we get that news that we didn't want to hear. We get that situation we didn't want to deal with. It's a suddenly. We thought everything was going well and then suddenly. And so the angels are there and then suddenly. And what kind of news is this going to be? And he says, don't be afraid. It's good news. But the truth is, no matter what, the Bible reminds us. Not to be afraid. That's why I love that last song. He's faithful. He's with us. No matter what's happening in our life, no matter whether we're dealing with something good, good news, bad news, anything in between, he is with us. Listen to what Paul says in Philippians chapter 4. Now, let me give you a little little context, uh, uh, a little content here. Uh, Paul is sitting on a beach in luxury and just hanging out. He's got a a, a martini in his hand. He's just taking it easy on the beach and saying, just rejoice in God because everything's easy. Oh, wait, sorry, that's the wrong version. Paul is sitting in jail in a Roman prison. Most likely he's chained to at least one soldier, if not two soldiers, and he's chained there, and he's writing a letter to the early church. And here's what he says to the early church. Rejoice in the Lord when everything's easy. No, he says rejoice in the Lord always. And then I love this. By the way, you got to realize ink was not easy to come by. We just write with a pen. We think words. It doesn't matter how many words we write, or we type them on our computer, and we just write as many as we want. You have to realize back then, Every letter that you wrote was work. And he says, rejoice in the Lord always. And I will say it again, rejoice. He's reminding us, this is important. Rejoice, redo your joy. Get back to joy. Let your gentleness be evident to all. Is prison a gentle place? Tom, you work in prison. Is it a gentle place? Not a whole lot of gentleness going on in prison, but yet Paul says, let your gentleness be evident to all. And then he says this, the Lord is near. You ever feel like God's not near? He's still near, even when you don't feel it. Do not be anxious about anything. And this word for anxious means to be distracted. How many of you are easily distracted? If you didn't raise your hand, you just didn't hear me because you were distracted, okay? (laughs) I get it, I get it. I'm there with you, okay? Okay. Do not be anxious about anything. What is anxiety? Anxiety is you're seeing this, but you're thinking about this fear, this thing that may go wrong, this thing that may happen, this concern that's happening in your life, this difficulty, this frustration, this aggravation, this irritation. And sometimes, by the way, that has a name, right? You know that person. As I'm talking about irritation, you're like, yeah, were you at my house on Thanksgiving? You should have been there. By the way, good answer for a lot of things on Thanksgiving is maybe, just so you know, when somebody wants to get in an argument, okay, (laughs) I don't know. In every situation, by prayer and petition, with Thanksgiving, present your request to God. Now, I I got a list of the top 2021 fears. I'm not sure this list is accurate because I kind of laughed when I read it. But here's what they say the top world fears are. And then I'm going to talk about personal fears. Here they were last year. Number one, loved ones dying. And some of you are like, but I can think of a... No, we're not going to do that. All right. (laughs) Number two, loved ones becoming seriously ill. Number three, this has probably moved up, mass shootings. Number four, not having enough money for retirement. Number five, terrorism. Number six, I just assume government corruption. I'm like, I don't worry about that. I just know it's true. That's just a, how is that a fear? That's just what it is. Government corruption. Yes. It's not, a, not an answer. Okay. Becoming terminally ill, 
hate crimes, high medical bills, and widespread civil unrest. Ah, you know. All right. So here's personal fears. And this, this brings us back to home. Here we are. Here's things that we fear. Number one, fear of failure. Fear of failure. I might fail. I may not make it. By the way, some people automatically feel like a failure. Some of you have been programmed since you were a kid to feel like a failure. You've been told you're a failure. You've been told it's never good enough. No matter what you do, if you've got to do one more thing to be good enough. And some of your parents, to give them grace, is I understand they were trying to make you the best person they want to be. But the message you received was, it's never good enough for them. And without meaning to, now you look in the mirror and you say, it's never good enough. So that fear of failure. Number two, fear of rejection. I had somebody tell me recently that they don't think anybody really likes them. People just put up with them. Can you imagine going through life thinking that even the people who love you the most don't really love you? They're just pretending? Wow. Fear of change. Fear of public speaking. Seinfeld said years ago, there were two top, the top two fears a few years ago. Number one was fear of public speaking, and number two was dying. And so he said people would rather be in the casket at the funeral than speak at the funeral. So I thought that was interesting. Fear of imperfection, not being good enough. We're back to that. Fear of vulnerability, fear of time. I don't know what that means. Fear of time. Woo! I don't know. And then fear of loneliness. Now, change brings fear and uncertainty. Some of those fears, as I talked about them, you totally relate to that. Some of you grew up in a home where you were fearful about everything. Hey, you may have grown up in a home with not enough food. And so now you have irrational fears about collecting stuff. Some of you are like, I don't know why I'm a hoarder. Well, think about when you were young, when you didn't have enough. And so now you're collecting things you don't need. By the way, a lot of us do that just because. Bad habit, right? Don't come to my garage. Do not come to my garage. But I might need that tool. Right, Don? Don totally relates to that. Number two, we can focus on the blessing. Now, here's the deal. When the angel shows up, I, when I get to heaven, I want to see this scene because here's what I wonder. Do you realize that when something scary happens... You ever watch a scary movie when it's like end of the world and something scary happens and a whole group of people is there and some of the people stay there and some of the people run away. And typically I'm rooting for the people running away. You might survive. You ran away from the aliens that are attacking the earth, right? And so I wonder if the shepherds were there. We don't know from this passage if some of the shepherds were like, see ya. But here's what I do know. We do that sometimes. When hard things happen and difficulties come and God's trying to teach us a lesson, we ignore the lesson and we hear what we want to hear. Listen to this next passage. Here it says, the, This will be a sign to you, the angel said. You will find a baby wrapped in cloths and lying in a manger. Suddenly, a great company of the heavenly host appeared with the angel. Here's that suddenly again. Praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest heaven and on earth. Peace to those on whom his favor rests. Now here's what I know about fear in our lives. Your fear is trying to teach you something. God can use your fear to teach you something about you. And if you simply do what so many of us do, if you look for an out... If you run away, if you seek pleasure instead, if you just look for distraction through entertainment and you don't take time to listen to the message, you won't learn the lesson. And you'll just continue to walk in that fear over and over again. Let me give you an example, very simple example, a little bit of an embarrassing story. I had a friend that asked me to work out and I started working out with him every day. I think we'd meet about 5.15 every morning. And so for over a year, we met every morning. And then one morning we were working out and one of his other friends walked in and he literally just walked off with his friend and started working out with him. And my brain instantly said these words. Well, I'm not working out here anymore. I guess I'm leaving and never coming back. I mean, this started processing in my brain. I'm like, that is the weirdest thing. 
Why would I instantly think, oh, because I feel like he's rejecting me. It was the weirdest feeling in the world. I was like, what is that about? And so when I went to leave, I even thought, don't say bye. Like that's some kind of weird. So of course I went out of my way. I went, see you later, dude. See you tomorrow. So the next morning, go to the gym. Exact same thing happens. My brain does the exact same thing. Why are you even working out here? It's obvious he doesn't want you here. Weird. I'm like, what is that about? What happened? The fear, right? So I had to figure out, well, what's going on? Why is this happening again? So after this happened a few times, all of a sudden my friend came back and brought the other guy over. What I realized he was doing is he was trying to get the other guy to start working out and then bring him into our group. He didn't tell me any of that, but he just shouldn't have needed to. My brain instantly went to worst case scenario, fear scenario, and what did I have to do? I had to fight through that and go, why is that such a big deal to you? Why did that one thing make you feel so hurt? But I had to stay there. Now, I could have run off. I could have never gone back to the gym. I could have never talked to that person again. Right? Those are easy things. Have you ever done that? You ever had somebody, you feel like they're going to reject you, so you just reject them? But you have to stay in it. Why? So you can build deeper friendships. So you can build deeper relationships with people. By the way, if you're going to be part of a church, can I tell you something that's going to happen here? This is a shocker. No one is perfect. Even, write this down, even the pastor. And so there's going to come a day as you get to know me. You ready? You're going to be disappointed one day. You're going to get to know me and going to be, Pastor Eric is such a jerk. What in the world? I, what? Yeah. And you've got to work through that. Otherwise, you won't have relationships with anyone. If you want a relationship with anyone, you must get through jerk phase. And that's on your end and their end. You've got to work through it and recognize they don't have their act together. And it's okay. Sit in there and listen to the message. The shepherds had to stay suddenly and hear what was said. But that's not all they did. Listen to what will happen as you do that. Philippians 4, 7 and 8. And the peace of God which transcends all understanding. Which means that sometimes in life you don't understand. There's times in life that you will go... I don't know. Your friend will say, why is this happening to me? And you'll go, I don't know. And you'll say, why is this happening to me? And you'll have to answer, I don't know. But the peace of God, which transcends all understanding, will do what? It will guard your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. This word for guard is the idea of look out for. It's the idea that when you begin to understand how you think, when you begin to understand that fear attacks you and a certain way of thinking, when you begin to learn how to deal with it and allow the Holy Spirit, then you're going to notice, oh, there's that thought again. Why, why do I have that kind of thought? Why do I feel like somebody working out with somebody else is a rejection of me? Why, why do I feel like that's never enough? Why do I feel like I always have to have a little more? Why am I never satisfied? Why is it never enough? Why do I feel so empty? And you've got to sit in that question and get that answer, but you've got to walk through the fear and then allow his peace, even when you don't understand, to cover you. And then it continues. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is, as Bill and Ted says, excellent. Or praiseworthy, think about such things. Why? Because we tend to think about everything that can go wrong and we tend to think selfishly and self-centered instead of saying, God, I'm going to focus on what you want me to focus on and these situations, these circumstances, as I sit here and learn about what you're teaching me, I'm going to have peace as I walk through this. When we walk through the valley of the shadow of death, the Bible says he's with us. 
I love what Billy Graham says about Christmas. Christmas should be a day when our minds go back to Bethlehem, beyond the noise of our materialistic world to hear the soft flutter of angels' wings. I know you're probably already looking at presents for whoever. Can I tell you that's not the meaning of Christmas? Do you need to watch The Grinch again? It's not the purpose. It's not the purpose. Number three. So change brings fear. We can focus on blessings. Number three, obedience brings blessings. When the angel left them and had gone into heaven, the shepherds said to one another, hey, let's go and see this thing which has happened, which the Lord told us about. So they hurried off and found Mary, Joseph, and the baby who was lying in the manger. When they'd seen him, listen, they spread the word concerning what had been told them about this child. And all who heard it were amazed at what the shepherds said to them. Time out. Do you realize that the angels could have gone much quicker and spread the message about Jesus? But that wasn't God's plan. God could have an angel move into your house and tell your neighbor about Jesus. But he doesn't. Because he has you. But Eric, you don't know what I said to the neighbor last time. Yes, I do. Your neighbor told me. <laughs> but the truth is, God puts you there, and you're in a spot, whether it's at work or at home, you're there because you can do the same thing the shepherds does, did if you're obedient. And you say, God, just use me like I am. By the way, sometimes your best witness is to tell people, I don't have my act together. They're not used to Christians saying that, by the way. I'm messed up. I got things to work on. So they go and share, and then it says, but Mary treasured up all these things, and I love this, pondered them in her heart. The shepherds returned, glorifying and praising God for all the things they had heard and seen, which is just as they had been told. Philippians 4, 9, Paul says this, whatever you've learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put into practice. That means just keep doing it, and the God of peace will be with you. This week, my niece came over to the house and she brought her drum pad. And those of you who don't know, I used to teach drum lessons years ago. So she came and she was doing some things and I was trying to teach her a rhythm. And I, so I was teaching her this early rhythm that you learn how to do in order to learn how to count and learn how to play drums. And she said, oh, oh, we have to do traditional stick holding. And I went, what? So we have to do. Now, when I first learned how to play drums, we did that. That's where you hold your left hand like this. I have not held a drumstick that way since I was 11. I'm a lot older than 11 now. <laughs> and, so, and so I had to, to show her, I went ahead and held my drumstick. Can I tell you, it was really uncomfortable and it took me a little while. I'm like, I don't even know that I can play this way. It was like bizarre. And then I realized for all of us, if you've been walking in fear your whole life, and you've been walking in rejection your whole life, and you've been feeling like God's far away your whole life, when you begin to, by faith, walk and listen and be obedient to what God's called you to do, at first, it's difficult. It feels really strange. But if you'll continue to be obedient. That friend of mine that I worked out with, we're still good friends. But you have to walk through the difficulty, the awkwardness, the weirdness, <laughs> the strangeness. And whether you're dealing with something internal or external, know that he's with you. God wants to walk with you through it. If you're here today and you've never given your life to Jesus Christ, you can do that today. I'll be here after the service. I'd love to talk to you about what it means to surrender your life to Jesus. Not just know about him, but to surrender your life to him. Knowing that he loves you, that he died for you and rose again to pay for your sins. If you're here today and as I talked about something, you recognized an area in your life that you just got to surrender to him, surrender that today. It's okay. He gives you new starts all the time. Let's close in prayer. Father, thank you for today, your word, your power, your strength, your love for us. Father, I'm so thankful that you use imperfect people when we will sit in fear, when we sometimes will sit and just listen to what you're saying to us, when we'll fight those thoughts and focus on what you're trying to teach us, that, Father, you'll use us. So, Lord, thank you for...